Welcome. Thank you for joining us today to discuss digital transformation for mutual insurers and some experiences of our members and partners. Leading the conversation today is Philip Reynolds, founder and chairman of Brightcore, the cloud platform, cloud-based core platform for PNC insurers and longtime partner of AAIS. Brightcore was founded in 2009 in partnership with six mutual insurers. The company has experienced rapid, rapid growth and now serves a community of over 70 insurance carriers, MGAs, and insurtechs. On behalf of AAIS, thanks, Phil and Brightcore, for putting this webinar together. Really looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Radagast Truman, and thank you, AAIS, for hosting us. Um, we're really looking forward to a lively discussion on digital transformation today. I'd like to introduce our three panelists on the discussion today. Uh, joining us first is Alex Gann, CIO and CTO of Farmers Fire Insurance Company. Alex and his team handle systems architecture, deployment and administration, direct software engineering, compliance reporting, and customer support. I've known Alex personally and Farmers Fire for many years, and I'm excited for Alex to share about the journey that he and his team have been on. So welcome, Alex. Our Thanks second panelist is Jason Buchek from OnRamp. Jason is a 10-year insurance executive and a strong believer in cloud-based systems architecture and agile processes. I've also known Jason for quite a while in several different roles, in fact. Um, it's worth noting that Jason is here representing OnRamp, an SI firm that partners with companies to successfully transition from legacy to modern platforms. OnRamp is a part of Alamance Farmers Mutual Insurance Company, and Jason manages OnRamp and is VP of Technology for Alamance. So Jason can speak to transformation both from what he has seen with his clients and from his own personal experience at Alamance. So welcome, Jason. Rounding out our panel is Ed Binks, Director of Sales at O'Brien Insurance Solutions. Ed has been involved in the communications industry for over 20 years, working in both traditional and digital channels. He works closely with insurance carriers on developing strategies that provide simple, cost-effective solutions through outsourcing. His experience helps guide their policyholder communications by streamlining processes and adding new capabilities. Welcome, Ed. At Brightcore, we pride ourselves on providing a nimble, cloud-based core platform for PNC insurers. So we're used to being right in the middle of our clients' digital transformation initiatives. I enjoy sitting down and having conversations like this one because we found that the digital transformation can look so different for each company. And it's not an event. It's not something you do just once. It's an ongoing journey. And each journey is unique and absolutely fascinating. So. Without further ado, I think let's jump in and, and hear from our panelists. Um, so question number one, thinking back on your digital transformation journey, how did it start? What challenges or opportunities were you trying to address? And let's start with you, Alex. Well, thanks, Phil. I'm happy to be on here today. So yeah, so Farmers Fire's transition to digital operations uh, really has been going on for you know, over 40 years now. If you really go back to the beginning, um, and I think it's a history for our company that is probably reflected by a lot of our peers and a lot of the folks on this call. And the real question is, you know, where are we on our journey and where is everyone on this call on their journey? And uh, hopefully we can help kind of walk through that. You know, before I joined the company, um, they deployed IBM System 32 and 38, uh, iSeries AS400. They had green screen terminals. Uh, that, and in that system, uh, they did rating, policies, claims, everything. Um, Later on, they added Dell small business servers. I still see them left over in the server room. <laughs> and, uh, and that handled, you know, the, you know, Windows domain clients. And we moved from physical terminals to Windows emulated clients. Um, a, a IBM Lotus Notes email, maybe something kind of like a website, um, you know. And, and so those were steps being made, but they were all made, I think, for the same reasons, same opportunities uh, that we chase today and continue to walk down. Um, and really, Phil, in the last 10 years in particular, though, um, it's really brought about really a complete transformation. So I think about that factoid. I'm not sure if it's totally true about, you know, every seven to 10 years or so, your body's not the same body anymore. You're still you, Phil, but, uh, but, but it, your cells aren't due to regeneration. Uh, so we're still Farmer's Fire, but really there isn't a single system process or operation in Farmer's Fire today uh, that's in common with the farmer's fire of a decade ago. Um, and so I would say the opportunities we've been chasing to, you know, on the second half of your question, what are we trying to secure? Uh, what are we doing? Um, really global improvements in technology have allowed us to thankfully continue down this exciting journey uh, that we've been on. 
Um, but the real opportunities could be summarized um, as, you know, I think five groups that, that I'd like to walk real quickly through. Um, and I, hopefully this resonates with the folks on the call. Really, uh, we're all, from 40 years ago to today, uh, we're driving efficiency, consistency, accuracy through process automation. Uh, so taking, you know, any, anything that's a manual touch process, automate it. Uh, you know, we're driving responsiveness and documentation and customer care through web and messaging services. You know, the more we can communicate uh, with our agents, with our customers, uh, availability, durability, uh, security, which is, actually, you know, obviously very important, flexibility through uh, redundant digital storage, uh, cloud native infrastructure, and we'll get more on that later, I think, in the, in the session here. Um, insight, underwriting, and optimizations through reporting and analytics on our well structured data. And lastly, uh, growth, productivity, and happiness through uh, agency empowerment and customer self-service. And I think whether it's, you know, going back to 1978 or here in 2021 and our roadmap going into, you know, 2025 and, 20, and 2030, uh, those are continue to be the things we're driving for. Uh, and, and the digital transformation has been a part of that the whole time. And, uh, and really is, is uh, you know, just an exciting journey to be on. For sure. Well, I like when I hear you talk about that, that for you and for Farmers Fire, and I know this to be true, having worked with you for a long time, that digital transformation really is a core part of your DNA that's touching the entire business. And, and I, I really appreciate that you all view it that way. Um, Jason, throwing to you, um, kind of how did your digital journey start and what challenges and opportunities were you trying to address? Uh, yeah, so... Alamance pretty much started uh, the digital transformation went to Brightcore. So in 2011 uh, is when we turned on our Brightcore instance and that got us away from doing everything with paper in all applications, all policy management. Um, once we were on with Brightcore, um, it, it kind of just took off from there. I joined the company in 2014 and uh, I was a remote employee half time. So we had all on premises phone services, stuff like that, all on premises server. Um, and and we, we had to go ahead and get ourselves away from that. So we pretty much picked a path, um, kind of documented every single process that we had, everything that was tied to the building itself. And we kind of listed them out uh, from the most difficult to integrate, which would probably be the most integral to our day. And then we just slowly went piece by piece, trying out different services. Um, people don't think about, you know, going remote. I'm sure COVID probably brought it up to them that um, if they have an on-premises phone service, you're going to have to give all your, every one of your contacts, you're going to have to give them your personal cell phone number, or you're going to have to buy a lot more automated call routing with your on-premises phone. Um, so that, that was one of our first big pieces. Uh, you know, we looked at a whole bunch of vendors and, and we solved that problem pretty quickly. Um, in about three to six months or so, we were up and running on a cloud service. And Pretty much, I would say, with every every service that we picked, that was kind of the route. It was a uh, we could see the opportunity if we went to a full digital uh, stack, something being in the cloud, we could manage it better. It wouldn't rely on our uh, infrastructure. The internet in Central North Carolina is not known to be the best, and so we could remove ourselves from that. Where you know, if we were all VPNing, VPNing into the into the company, we would probably take the company down. So um, there would be no internet available left for the actual office to run. Um, so yeah, we, we we picked each service and we just kind of documented and went that way. And um, we definitely hit a couple couple roadblocks, couple stumbling blocks with data conversions as we're trying to get away from our content management system. Um, um, we had to pick several different services uh, to store in the cloud, but uh, we did it. And uh, each service took us about three to six months to, to fully roll onto it and start using it in our daily life. It's awesome. And I think um, a, a significant value driver, especially for smaller mutuals that don't have massive IT infrastructure, um, is that sort of that disaster recovery and availability aspect. Um, just just the, the knowledge that there is a huge data center and a lot of redundancy and all those things sort of built behind the scenes so that your physical office really is um, a lot more optional than what it would have been in the past. And I know you all have really embraced that heavily. Ed, how about for you, um, the beginning of your digital journey and some of the challenges that were trying to be addressed? Ed, I think we have you muted right now. Oh, there we go. First technical difficulty of the day. Um, speaking through uh, through the lens of uh, of our customers, really it was around 
you know, modernizing policyholder communications um, as new technologies emerge in, uh, in printing, uh, in mailing and delivering those, uh, those communications. Um, it's, it's difficult for, for a lot of mutual insurance companies to, to, to keep up with that. So we're able to provide that at, at scale for those customers. Um, along with that, within the communications, uh, the challenges are around adding, whether it's uh, uh, special mailings or custom deliverables, marketing communications. Um, the processes involved in that can be sometimes overwhelming or take, you know, uh, uh, adding a new document can sometimes take weeks or months to, to develop and implement along with, uh, with the regular communications. So being able to, to, you know, for us, partnering with, uh, with OnRamp and them being a subject matter expert and knowing Brightcore so well, uh, developing processes that we can more seamlessly uh, and quickly add, uh, whether it's marketing communications, um, special documents, special mailings, and allow insurance carriers to, to focus on what they do best, and that's insurance. Absolutely. And I think um, a key point from that is that a digital transformation journey doesn't have to be a solo effort. And um, it, it's, it's very easy to feel like um, all the responsibility has to rest with uh, you know, one IT person who works at the company. Um, and, and one of the, I think the key values and that we try to drive with our customer base, is just look, there's this, there's this giant ecosystem of partners who really know what they're doing um, in particular verticals and in particular workloads. And, and, and it's surprisingly cost-effective to utilize them and uh, kind of like going and remodeling your own bathroom, uh, the contractor can do it in a, you know, in a quarter of the time for probably half the cost <laughs> if you, when you really go and try to do it yourself. Um, it's, it's not that different. Um, uh, move, moving on, thank you all very much. Um, could you all share with the audience the key decisions um, sort of around technology, business processes, culture shifts that you either you've had to make or you've seen um, you know, customers of yours have to make um, over the course of the journey that you've been on through transformation efforts. And, and Ed, let's go ahead and hang with you since you just talked for a second and we'll, we'll kind of work our way backwards. Sure, absolutely. So, um, you know, for, for us, it was, uh, you know, identifying um, uh, an individual or, or, or an organization, um, you know, such as OnRamp that, uh, that again, has a, a, a deep knowledge and, and understanding of, uh, of Brightcore and how, you know, that system works, how the documents are, are generated uh, and passed along and what that process looks like. So being able to leverage that knowledge um, and develop, you know, really from our perspective, a, a, a solution that was, uh, that can provide more efficiencies and, and more capabilities, um, really it, it gives, all the mutuals, the ability to uh, to not have to worry about it, and and be able to grow and add whether it's you know new documents through endorsements, uh, you know special mailings, things like that, that they can uh, you know they can operate more effectively, more seamlessly, and uh, and make changes faster. Perfect. Thank you, Jason. How about for you? The just some of the key decisions around technology, business processes, and culture shifts. Um, that were sort of critical to a successful digital transformation? Yeah, culture is probably going to be one of the biggest things to hit on here, uh, especially in your internal workforce. Most people that are, you know, talking about going digital, they're really not used to the concept of going fully paperless in any way. And digital doesn't have to mean fully paperless, but, and usually it does. Um, so when we're doing it is probably go ahead and actually instill the idea that the office will be out of, out of, out of pocket for somebody every day, every day of the week. That's what we do internally at Alamance. Um, everybody's required at least one day um, every couple of weeks to work away from the office. So we can then see what is tying you to that office. Um, you know, you've, if you've decided to start the process, then you've decided to start it. You might as well just jump in. It's not going to be easy. Um, it's not particularly hard, but it's definitely a shift in the culture. Um, you're not going to have the, you know, the water breaks where you're stopping over and seeing Sandy and, and, you know, saying hi to everybody that you're there, but you still can get that with video calls and people need to start getting used to those. Um, you're not going to have, um, you know, walking over to the server if it turns off. So what are you going to do if you don't have access to your documents? You can't, you can't just do that. Um, so I, I, the biggest decision that we made was just to start. Um, pick something, 
write it down, and then look for some vendors. You're probably going to be working unless you're building your own solution out, um, which most people aren't really willing to do. Uh, go, go find somebody. And then will it go right the first time? Not necessarily. And uh, especially because you're going to be revamping all of your processes to then incorporate this, not going to have somebody right next to you when you're at home. You're then going to need to think, rethink about what your disaster recovery plan looks like and how you're going to function on a day-to-day -day office. But once you pick to start, just go ahead and start and it'll get easier. It's pretty much the best way to say. I can't emphasize that enough. Having led 75 plus system conversions before, um, I have watched many, many a, an insurance carrier uh, attempt to work through all the details ahead of time and the reality is systems are complex, business processes are complex, especially in a small company, it tends to be true that not everything's written down. And so you, there is no, um, there's no lesson like just doing it, <laughs> just, just move forward and walk into the room and, and solve the next problem. So I, I really love that advice to just, just start unplugging from the office and see how it goes. Um, Alex, for you, key decisions, technology, business process, culture shifts. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, one of the big things, you know, when I joined the company and, you know, started getting my feet more and more into the process, um, you know, kind of came up with this idea of just trying to emphasize, you know, we are Farmers Fire Insurance Company, and Ed brought this up earlier, you know, we're not Farmers Fire Payment Processors, we're not Farmers Fire Data Center Operator, uh, we're not Farmers Fire Printing and Mailing, uh, relevant to Ed there, uh, we're not Farmers Fire Telecommunication, Telecommunications Inc., um, and so, so we really, you know, want to be able to focus our time and our energy on the things that make us, you know, what our core business is and anywhere that we were finding processes, you know, consuming our staff's time, uh, doing, handling these operations that aren't part of our core business. Those were the ones that we really felt were, you know, the right picks for, um, being able to outsource, um, and so, because that was a big decision, as uh, Jason already mentioned, which was, you know, when do you go in-house versus vendor manage? You know, not too many years ago, we had full-time staff at Farmers Fire, you know, th that worked in the mail room. We had a mail room uh, and, and we printed and we folded and we stuffed envelopes and we dropped off every day all of our mailings. Um, and that process is completely gone, um, you know, and, and that staff is able to be, you know, rededicated to efforts that are more directly tied to true insurance, uh, underwriting and uh, risk evaluation and uh, assisting agents with uh, questions around our, you know, our products and, and what we have to offer. Um, so within that decision in-house versus vendor manage, um, as Jason mentioned, you know, some items you might take on in-house, certainly we had a legacy of software development. Uh, maybe some other carriers on this call also have some IT staff in-house that you know, it's valuable to the company, has done a lot for the company, um, and continues to build and add new value every day. Uh, certainly, I don't think it would make any sense to, to get rid of that. You know, Phil, you and I have talked over the years in past conferences even about, you know, a general recommendation that, hey, if you're an insurance carrier and you can get an engineer, get an engineer. <laughs> it will help. If you have someone living and breathing in your system every day, um, but also has the insights of what it takes to make that system run. Uh, that individual will guaranteed uh, return the value of the investment you make in them. Um, and so having that team is important. I think even if you are partnered with uh, many vendors, that can be very helpful to you. Uh, it's important the more our companies do fully digitize and all our processes move um, maybe out of office uh, to make sure that you really do have at least you know, some staff that, that truly understands what's going on. Um, and the, the ins and outs of those. Um, and then lastly, from a decision-making standpoint, something that came in and maybe we'll touch more later too, it's just prioritization. Um, you know, Jason, I think touched on it where he said, you know, hey, well, we were picking off some processes as we go uh, and we did something similar. You can't do everything at once. Uh, so really what comes first? And that, that was a big part of our journey is figuring out well, what does come first. And we've kind of settled over the last several years on almost a round robin <laughs> kind of approach where where uh, people's needs, whether, you know, if you look at our groups of, you've got our, our internal staff, which is, has departments within that from accounting to underwriting uh, to claims. Uh, you've got your agency base, 
you know, your new business, your agency portal, what kind of access do they have? Are you doing downloads of policy information to their management system? Uh, can you accept uh, comparative rater quotes? Um, you know, these are features that agents, you know, it reduces friction with them. And then lastly, our customers, what kind of experience can they have? And so all those projects are completely, you know, almost certainly completely different uh, tasks to take on. And so uh, being able to drive all those and avoid context switching um, to be able to carve out, you know, a matter of days, uh, probably about the maximum we get around here where you can really focus on one thing and try to get it done. Um, you know, that was a decision we had to make um, collectively as a company and deliberately to say, okay, well, all right, if you're on the team that's working on the paperless migration, um, you know, back when we did that, uh, you know, we are dedicating time and energy and focus to that task. Uh, and this is not something that we expect to just happen. We understand that this is going to take uh, concerted effort within the company. So, so those were some of the big pieces that I think as a company we went through together uh, as we were going through that. A couple of things you said in there that I think uh, are sometimes missed in this discussion. Uh, number one, I really love that you focused on sustained attention. Um, that is without a doubt necessary. And when we see companies struggle with uh, transformation initiatives or really any technology initiative, it tends to be true that there are too many irons in the fire and too many things are being you know, sort of bitten off at once. And, uh, and it, it, it is a big project. Any project like this, which Jason, I know you just mentioned a second ago as well, it, it's large and you have, to, you have to really make the time and the, the brain space for it. Um, another thing that I, I really like that you touched on there is the um, the idea of repurposing staff towards um, value streams, and uh, I think that that's easy to overlook because an insurance company, especially if you're you sort of still operating in a very traditional model, um, it has been true that that mailroom is running in the back, and it has been running for the last eighty years or whatever it's you know it's been for you. Um, but at the end of the day, no insured's life was improved. You don't offer really better service in any way because there are three people in the back room stuffing that envelope. As long as the, the document makes it out, you've done a good job. And, um, and so you have these people that you're investing, you know, frequently decades in as staff and putting those people on direct value delivery to customers, improving that customer experience, that turnaround time, the attention, um, you know, response time on claims, all of those things is a better use of all of our resources um, and it ultimately drives better customer satisfaction in the long run. So I, I love that you hit on those things. Um, moving around, let's let's shift over to uh, core systems and, and how did core systems fit into your digital transformation plans and were they planned day one? Was there a sort of a core systems transformation planned on day one or, or did that need emerge later in the process? And let's actually, Jason, let's start with you this go around. Yeah, um, I, I would say probably the same way Alamance is, is probably a lot of the way all my implementations are going. Uh, it, it was the start. Um, it, it wasn't, we didn't find it that we wanted to go that way. It was just, we, we want something better. So we found the core system, which then allowed us to go ahead and say, where can we branch from that point? Um, it was great. It was a huge change in the operations to, to not be going into the server, to taking a paper application, all that kind of stuff. Um, but once you, once you make that decision to go that route, it, it's kind of just leads into it. What's the next step? Um, so for all the people that I work with, it's usually the first step in the chain. They know they want more. They can't necessarily describe what they want yet. Um, they just know they want more than what they have. Um, and you know, Core systems is, is definitely a good place to start because that will hit probably 90% of your operations that you're going to do on the daily basis. And that's going to start uncovering places where, well, we, we built some pretty crazy ideas and procedures um, based on this old platform. So now we're going to go to a new platform. Why would we keep the old platform? And when you're doing that, well, let's go ahead and actually start documenting all the other crazy stuff we're doing. Um, and then let's see what we can not do that because that's just not good. So, um, for us, core system was the absolute first step, um, getting into a digital world. Um, we had a server, if you want to call that digital, and we were logging into it on a computer, which a lot of people do feel still that that's going digital, but that's really not, um, definitely not comparatively to uh, 
big dollar projects where things are going massively hyperscale digital. Some people talking about blockchain to like actually keep their data so it's secured in their GLs. But, um, you know, compared to that, we're talking about two different things. For most people, it's going to be, you, you can't even go to O'Brien and say, hey, can I have printing if you have to literally print from your server unless you do some custom way to get your files over to Ed. Um, so, yeah. The, the core system is always a great place to start. Um, and most people I see, that's, 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 the, that's the start of their journey of where they, they realize they want to do other things better. Now, that's great. Um, it, and, and I agree that starting with core systems is a great place to start. Um, Alex, for you, how, how was it for Formers Fire? Where did the core systems interface with the whole journey? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, core system replacement was definitely on our radar since probably the early 2000s. And before I joined the company, I remember talking uh, with staff um, that there were plans, discussions, you know, projects, starts and stops, fits and, uh, fits and starts. Um, but before that really took hold, uh, the company did complete some other pretty serious projects um, around modernization. So I think the first really large scale one that came in was when we went paperless. So we deployed paperless filing system and defined automated workflows uh, using ImageWrite. Um, we selected ImageWrite, you know, we thought it was best to breed uh, from software for what it did. Very shortly thereafter, Vorta 4 acquired them. Uh, so apparently we were thinking right and, uh, and they've grown since then. Uh, and we still use ImageWrite uh, to this day. We have like 1.5 terabytes of, of, you know, images of all of our files in it. Um, and it's all... You know, and that's all backed up across uh, multiple time zones in AWS. Uh, and, uh, and so we know that our files are secure, are available, well-documented with good metadata. Um, shortly after that, another big project we tackled uh, was uh, working with our agency base. Again, talking about switching you know, those focuses, internal customer uh, agency. Uh, so we added real-time rating. That was actually my start with Farmers Fire was act, uh, as a contractor built uh, web-based real-time rating uh, started with some commercial products and ultimately extended across all of our product lines. And this was all before we were even looking at core system, uh, but we give our agents self-service access to policies, claims, uh, agency performance data, how are they doing, um, you know, both on monthly commissions and also on overall contingent uh, program. Um, and all of that was integrated real-time with our legacy system. So basically the idea was, you know, may, and maybe that was a stopgap, uh, but what we really wanted was to, to be able to give those benefits of a modern system. Uh, but we weren't really, I think, ready to take on, you know, whether it was from staff or just vendor availability or just where the market was. Um, you know, this was back in maybe 2012, 2013 uh, timeframe. Um, but then uh, our first step into the cloud, we migrated our email communications off of Lotus Notes uh, to Office 365. And that was big for us. Um, that there was, you know, uh, there was a winter day, and and uh, and internet went out at the office. Primary internet went out at the office, and so all of our systems that our agents were connecting to that were connected to an on-premises server were down. Uh, but staff had their cell phones and had their email on their cell phones and could still work with the agents. You know, the phone systems were down, and uh, internally on the PRI, uh, and yet we still had. Uh, access and we could still do business through that one system. And the realization was, wait, the one system that didn't go down is the one that, you know, we put on the cloud. And I think a lot of the fear about availability and, and not being able to hold our data. And I think that's pretty well established throughout the industry. Now, I doubt there's too many people on this call, maybe a few folks that are still a little uncomfortable. I think most folks really have embraced this idea and are okay with, um, with what that means. Um, but it wasn't until all that was completed that we looked at core. Um, and so, yeah, in about 2014, uh, President Rick Reese, uh, a time approach came to IT and said, hey, I'm retiring in a, in a handful of years. I think he gave me a four year, he gave our team four year timeline. And uh, he said, look, you know, I see is something he built and he didn't want to leave with what he built still being the thing that ran the company. Uh, he wanted to know that there was a new vision going forward, a new platform going forward. And so, uh, you know, the story for everyone here, you know, Phil and I met <laughs> uh, coincidentally at a PAMIC conference. Our CFO uh, forced me to go to. I, I'm a bit of a homebody. And, uh, and so I would recommend my lesson learned there is uh, go to, uh, go to PAM, you know, wherever you are, go to your uh, local 
uh, insurance industry consortiums to your groups, to your meetings and, and network and, and reach out and talk to others. Um, you know, we certainly, I'd looked a little bit at vendor systems and, and was not terribly impressed. Uh, and then I met Phil and Brightcore and, and that changed my mind pretty quickly. Uh, we were pretty aligned on what I was going to go do and, and what they were already doing. Uh, they had several years head start on us there. And so, so yeah, um, you know, that was the edict. We were 100% finished our migration. All of our policies were across uh, by November of 2017. So within that four-year timeline, we did it. And, um, and yeah, Rick stayed on a few more years even after that because uh, life was going so well. He just retired here at the end of 2020. And now uh, Craig Lodbrook's taking the role of president. So, um, but yeah, so core system up front, it wasn't, I know we, we knew we wanted it, but we did, you know, just to hear the opposite side of what, you know, Jason's seen on, on some of his customers, we started and got our feet wet with some of our other processes that we could modernize um, and, and, you know, took more steps into cloud and that kind of thing. And then, and then, you know, ultimately bit off the big one and uh, it's gone well. Well, I appreciate that, Alex. I think uh, just for the audience, notably, those are two almost, um, opposite strategies that the two companies utilized. One, starting with your core system and building out, um, which is a great strategy, probably the most cost-effective strategy, um, but also the riskier strategy. Um, what Alex did at Farmers Fire is slower, it's more time consuming, it's a bit more expensive, but to tackle all of the auxiliary systems first, interface them with your legacy core system, and then migrate those things to the new system, um, the advantage to that strategy is things like your agent um, portal and other experiences, those things remain consistent through the shift. So it doesn't feel like such a large scale change to your customer base. Um, I think, Ed, for you, uh, you sort of come at it from a different angle as a solution provider. What do you sort of see and where do you see across your customer base core systems um, impacting the digital transformation journey? And what goes well with that? What goes poorly with that? Sure. So. So everything that we do, I mean, our, our solution is is really a byproduct of core systems modernization. Um, it's it, it's it's hard to make those decisions, um, and it can be very costly um, and time consuming when you're working in a legacy system um, to understand okay what is the what is the effort and what's it going to take to uh, to do something like outsourcing your policyholder communications. So so as you know as you're as you make the decision to, you know, to uh, to redeploy or put a new core system, um, we we've had lots of engagements where we work with the insurance company as they're making those decisions and as they're making those transitions. Um, really, it it can be a, a more seamless process. Whereas, you know, once once the core system's in place, yes, there's a there's a general integration that uh, that happens. Um, if we can get involved during that transition, we can help drive some of the some of the decision making around, um, you know, everything from what the policyholder documents may look like, um, how many we're, you know, how many different documents we're going to add, the ordering, um, and be able to add some capabilities such as marketing communications within there. Uh, when we are when when we're included in the process of that, that modernization, uh, there's a lot of value that we can bring so that when you go live, um, you already have uh, our solution in place. Um, and it, you know, and again, it creates kind of that seamless process and, uh, and, and drives value from, from day one. You know, the thing I really like about what you highlighted there is that, um, and I, I can't emphasize this enough, uh, the more that you, uh, integrate all of your solution providers, you give them access to each other, you facilitate an open dialogue, the better that's going to go. You don't want all of them treating each other like a black box, dealing with surprises mid midstream on these big projects. You want everyone talking all the time. And I really, I really like that comment on, on try to get, you know, like your document solution vendor or your imaging vendor or whoever you know, you're utilizing payment processing, whatever the case may be, talking to all your other vendors and all talking to your core solution provider. Um, so that, so that so that you have a better experience because because those people do it a lot <laughs> they, they do they do that job a lot they've been through that it's not their first rodeo you know um, all right let's do the quick sort of a pivot to more of a, a current event topic um, and we'll try to keep these these answers really brief because we're going to run low on time if we don't um, just real real quickly 
How did the pandemic impact your efforts? And um, have you seen digital transformation initiatives accelerated, stalled? What has the effect of sort of quarantine the pandemic been? And Ed, let me throw back to you. Sure. So um, we've really we, we've seen a, a, a really an increase um, in you know in activity and interest, um, and a big part of that comes in in the aspects of business continuity planning, right? And disaster recovery. Um, you know, most most carriers have some type of business continuity plan in place. Um, not all of them had pandemic and and that goes for i think and in every industry and and globally across the board um you know global pandemic was not in everyone's uh business continuity plan so um so when it occurred and we started to see this this shift towards remote working um one of the final elements one of the last elements um, um and difficulties everyone had was managing something like their print and mail, right? Someone still had to go into the office and manage the printers and stuff, fold, meter, get get these things out the door. So conversations that we had been having um, really sped up. Um, and I think the, you know, the importance of understanding that, okay, you know, we, we need to have a solution in place and how are we going to manage this really came to the forefront and it came to the forefront very quickly. Um, so, so from our perspective, you know, there was, um, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of sped up implementations um, and just more conversations around how you know how are you going to manage you know so that these non core functions or some core functions that you may have where uh, where it, it couldn't be managed remotely so uh, so you know from from our perspective um, it, it the pandemic really sped up that decision making in uh, in you know in what do we want to manage in house and what do we want to you know outsource to to a third party absolutely um and we've seen an acceleration ourselves a lot a lot of additional increased traction from customers who are looking to move to the cloud um having moved to remote work so um alex how about for yourself yeah, I mean, keeping it brief, uh, it wasn't a huge impact uh, because in 2018 and 2019, we led projects to basically uh, make sure that our office wasn't needed. So we had Ring Central for VoIP. Uh, we use mass printing for Mailstream and and um, you know printing in Mailstream with Brightcore. Uh, it's been great. Uh, worked with Vertifor. We migrated actually our company. You know, all of our staff workstations. Uh, you know, the desktop I'm on right now uh, isn't my local laptop over here. Um, and so, so everyone, you know, whether they're at home or anywhere else uh, is running on Amazon workspaces, uh, which has been really great for us. And Vertifor um, has a team that we partnered with that gave us the confidence that even though, you know, personally I had and other people on our team had experience with AWS, um, it was good knowing that, well, here's a company that's done this for uh, a thousand employee, you know, companies. And, you know, so our, we knew our 20 were in good hands um, and that we'd have best practices applied. So that's been really great. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so not really huge impact uh, to how we operate other than, you know, most folks uh, didn't have to come in. We did have, uh, you know, a couple of skeleton crew come in um, to, to handle a few things. Um, but then for prioritization, uh, 2021, how that impact happened, um, you know, I think now, you know, we're really back on trying to drive our focus back to our agency base, um, and, and continue to just add more automation, more direct interfaces with them. Um, straight through processing is a major initiative we have, um, for direct issuance of policies right from quote without any, uh, staff at, um, farmers Fire having to touch that, uh, through, through automated underwriting rules. So. Um, so that's what we're looking for um, on, on the year ahead. That's great. And I think you, you touched on a point there. I'll just reiterate briefly. I know a lot of times when people talk about going virtual and digital, um, they say, well, you know, I've got this piece of software that's still an install-based system. You know, one that we see come up a lot is a lot of smaller insurance companies particularly use QuickBooks, like the old original install version of QuickBooks for their accounting system. And people are, don't realize the Amazon Workspaces allows you to install your desktop PC out on the cloud and access it from anywhere through remote desktop effectively. And that's very cost effective, very easy. And then you have your PC anywhere and everywhere. Yes. You yeah, you don't have to move to all cloud-based software to get completely virtual. And I, and I know you all have had tremendous success with that initiative. Yeah. 
it recommended highly. Awesome. Jason, how about for you, man? Pandemic, uh, pandemic and COVID effects. Well, the Alamance side, it was, it was nothing. I mean, same as Alex, we've been, um, we haven't been dependent upon the building for years. Um, you know, still a skeleton crew, got to, got to go to the mail, got to go to the post office to go get the mail, get the checks, that kind of thing. Um, but you know, there's always plans in place for that. Um, what I'm seeing on a lot of, uh, Customers' implementations, though, is that uh, as the pandemic's kind of coming to a close, or at least kind of coming to a close, some people are going back more into their office. And the ideas that drove them in the first place, I believe, to do a core systems implementation is are falling back on that. Well, I like my paper, so I want to I want to keep that paper. And you know that so the the ideas that they had going in, they may not have coming back out. Um, I hope they they can continue going on with that. And I hope everybody's still excited where they were last year because they're going to forget if you don't uh, how affected you were um, when, when everything was closed down, it, just because you move your back end system off the, uh, off your on-prem does, doesn't mean you're done. If you want to get away from your building, if everything else is still tied to it in some way, somebody's still going to have to be there in, in another pandemic or a hurricane for us could, could still take you out. So it's a, it, it's a good idea um, um, to, to keep going, be vigilant about it. Um, maybe you can take it a little slower because hopefully it won't happen again for another couple decades, <laughs> if ever, but uh, you know, still, still keep vigilant on it and draw the processes and maybe you bought yourself a little bit extra time to, to move that way. Couldn't agree more. Um, and for our audience members, um, if you want to start posting a couple of questions in the chat, um, we'll have about 10 minutes at the end of this uh, where we can, our panelists can answer a few questions. So feel free to go ahead and start adding those. Uh, last structured question for all of our panelists. Um, you know, in pre previous to asking this, uh, last year, Brightcore commissioned a survey of mutual and mid-market insurers and we found out that about 50% of those core systems um, in office are more than 20 years old. And um, it, quite a few of the customers that we reached out to and the insurers that we reached out to, um, their systems were so old, no one in the building can tell you how old they were or when they were turned on or when they were installed and that no one recalled or had record. Um, and so, so obviously modernization is tremendous need um, across the industry, there are a ton of carriers who have yet to really tackle it all. Um, what advice would you have for CEOs and other senior business and IT leaders who are in the position right now of running a system that is old and they're, they're nervous or scared, they're not quite sure what the next step is. Um, they're just, they haven't done it yet for whatever reason. Um, just, you know, 60, 90 seconds. What advice would you give them? Jason, let's start with you. So that's why they have to know that answer of why they even want to do it. Um, Alex is a perfect example of you do not necessarily need to upgrade your core system if you can do all your auxiliaries. But um, coming back into that, everybody should always be reevaluating every, um, we all evaluate our policies every two to five years on a renewal process. The concept that we wouldn't renew our processes and everything that we do and every vendor that goes along with it is is crazy. So I mean, just because it worked 20 years ago doesn't mean it works today. Um, you might think that it works today, but everybody below you might not think so, uh, or you might want to get something out of it. So once you actually do get your why about, um, and if you don't have one, like Alex said, go to the conventions, um, start talking to some people. If they can tell you, hey, uh, yeah, we have a direct to market strategy. And you're like, I don't even know how I'd even start that. And, and chances are, if you're on a 40 year old platform, you're not going to be able to go ahead and start that. That's not going to probably happen. So um, in that case, uh, yeah, um, definitely think about it that way. Great advice, Jason. Ed, how about for you? Uh, you know, I would say commit, you know, number one, commit to making that change and build consensus within all the stakeholders in the organization um, so, that, so that everyone's on the same page and everyone understands, you know, the importance of, of making that leap. Um, from there, you know, we work, the, the insurance industry, it's, it's not a big industry. We all know, you know, CEOs, IT folks that are on both sides of the fence, still on legacy, you know, have new core systems in place, uh, 
have those conversations with those who have made that, you know, that Alex with, you know, with Jason who have made those transformations and understand, you know, what went well, what didn't go well. And from there, I think you can really build some clarity. Um, and again, with the consensus within the organization, uh, you know, move forward with, with that confidence and make those decisions and just get started. I think um, uh, it was the, either Alex or Jason earlier said, like, just get started with it, you know, take that first step um, and, and build from there. Also, excellent, excellent advice. And Alex, finally for you, what advice would you give to executives um, who have not made this, this shift yet? Uh, yeah, so no surprise, replacing core systems is an exceptionally arduous task. <laughs> Get your best and brightest together. Uh, be prepared for them to be very time-consumed, uh, time-limited on their project. Uh, uh, during what might be you know, likely a year to years long project, depending on how much you've got to do. Um, automated, validated, pre-tested data migration is also not easy to do, uh, but can provide huge benefits uh, as you roll and renew off your old system. I'd recommend if you have policies to migrate, which almost certainly do, rolling renewal uh, is the way to go. Um, 12 months, just roll them on. Um, do your due diligence when vendor selection. I'd recommend personally a vendor that's actually cloud native. It doesn't matter if they're AWS, Azure, Google Cloud. Uh, avoid being a data center operator yourself, though. Um, I would recommend uh, a system that's CICD. That's a little technical term, but basically uh, continuous integration deployment over quarterly or less frequent releases. Uh, let's get those new features out there readily, automatically, and fully tested. Um, you know, if they've got automated tests uh, that are running on that code, you can be very confident, even though you get new features quickly, uh, that they're not breaking your system. Um, uh, make sure that they've got a ready supply of customers uh, that are in your peer company group that are going to be open, positive, available to share insights to you uh, about what they've learned and any shortcomings on the product. Uh, so the more users of that system that you're looking at, you can talk to the better. Um, make sure that the vendor is continuously improving, innovating for their existing and their new customers. Uh, you know, find out what's on their roadmap. You know, if you're implementing a system, you might be great if you've got 10 years maturity on it. Uh, what are they doing going forward? Um, so I personally happen to know a vendor that meets all those criteria. <laughs> Uh, but, but yeah, and, and so on implementation, lastly, don't hold too tightly to tradition um, or recreating what you know from your old systems. Be willing to listen to benefit from the experience of the vendor you're working with. They've taken many companies like yours through the journey. Um, and that can be hard to get, get rid of tradition or just, well, this is how we already d always did it. Um, there might be a better way. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's brought me measurable improvements for us. Our IT costs have reduced 25% since we've migrated all our systems over. Uh, we've had a 40% increase in productivity measured by premium in force over our full-time staff count. Uh, so we're growing as a business and not having to uh, grow in uh, staff commensurate to it. Um, and most importantly, it keeps us ready to go for the next projects. Uh, we're, it's so much easier to add new features now and to continue to grow um, now that we don't have the tech debt and the burden of our legacy systems. Excellent advice across the board. I could go drop into a lot of follow-up on all of those, but we will firmly run out of time. I've um, had a couple of audience questions uh, come through. Uh, so let's, uh, let's hit this one really quickly. What's the biggest challenge or risk with digital transformation that maybe doesn't get enough attention? What, what do people tend to overlook? And uh, let's throw here to Alex, let's back to you. Yeah, I, I think some of the biggest challenges that we encountered maybe that we didn't look at right off the bat on digital transformation um, would, would probably be around the scope and scale, especially you know just back on core system, um, the scope and scale of what it takes to migrate your data. Um, I think data migration is maybe overlooked, uh, you know, presumed like that's something that uh, could go into you really you know, do you have database access structured access to the existing data of your policies of your claims um, you know if you if you're one of those 50 percent of respondents that say we don't even know when our system came into being um, definitely before your support runs out on it make sure you can get database access you know some form of structured query access um, that will pay huge dividends 
Um, though, depending on your scale, you might, I know there's customers that uh, mainly renewed and were able to re-underwrite kind of all their policies during their transition year and they did it by hand and it was a team effort. Um, so I know that is possible, but you know, for us and at all costs, I, I would say if you can get structured data out of your existing system, uh, it's pretty critical. Yeah, I couldn't agree. Data conversion, uh, data conversion is a frequently overlooked uh, feature, something that we always emphasize at the beginning of the project and start asking people to think about. And uh, the quality of data we're able to get out of various systems varies dramatically. Um, so it's certainly a, a meaningful consideration. Um, next question, how would you counsel an insurance leader who is asking about ROI? Is digital transformation really a wise investment? Jason? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I don't know about core system because if you're coming from something that's 40 years old, it, you might have paid for it 40 years ago and you don't get any upgrades. So that's going to cost more money, right? But every other service that we were continuing to pay for has been cheaper once we factor in everything else with it. A lot of them came back cheaper um, just per month. Um, it was a big sticker shock to buy Ring Central because um, we had three lines in the office, which was like 300 bucks or something like that. Um, and the Ring Central bill came in at a little bit more than that. But we also had significantly more uh, lines uh, and we weren't tied to the building. So I was a remote employee. To forward a call out is going to take two phone lines. We're quickly going to run out of three phone lines. And so then you're not really comparing apples to apples there. Um, so a lot of people, when they're doing that, they, they try to compare the, the cost and then some other costs that they're paying today, but it's not really the same thing. And, and you have to make sure you actually do that. Um, compare the apples to apples process. So when we went outsourced on the printing, um, you know, there's, there's a big discussion, take the labor into consideration, take the liability risk of having your employee drive to the post office to mail off those big packets. And then a, and you might find, and you probably will find that it's actually cheaper to mail with a vendor like O'Brien. Um, but you're also then, if you take the other things in consideration about lost time, mailing only takes on the biggest day of the year now, three and a half minutes. <laughs> um, that's a nice boon that you don't even think about. So um, ROI needs to be more than just what I'm paying for the service and what I was paying for the service. Couldn't agree more, Jason. And, and one of the major factors in an ROI calculation is also what benefit do you hope to gain? Um, presumably a very large, massive digital migration strategy shouldn't just be about replacing uh, what is there with, to do the same thing with newer. <laughs> newer is not really that valuable. Um, you're presumably going after, after new customers and new market share or new capabilities. And so, so you have to factor that in as well. Um, another question, how about leaders who fear they don't have the skills in-house to manage digital transformation? How could they be successful if they don't have the skills in-house? Ed, let me throw to you. Sure. Um, so, really, you know, when you're, you know, when when we're working with the with the client, um, you have two. You know, there's two different sides to lean on, and that is that you know you don't have to have all the answers. Um, you don't have to be the subject matter expert on on uh, on on the, your digital transformation or or you know what you're trying to accomplish. But when you surround yourself and you have people around you that you can count on that have that subject matter expert, and that would be, you know, for us working with, uh, you know, working with OnRamp and working with Jason to better understand, you know, the output and the documents coming from Brightcore, um, we, can, we can build our knowledge base with, you know, with someone like an on-ramp um, or you know, other individuals who have that subject matter expert. And you, know, you can educate yourself that way, um, but you don't always have to have every answer yourself. You, can, you, have, you have plenty of folks around you, um, you know, between uh, you know, at, at Brightcore, at on-ramp, um, you know, pick up the phone and, and call Alex at Farmer's Fire. I'm sure, I'm sure he'd love to, you know, to, to chime in and help out. So uh, you don't have to go at it alone. There's, there's, uh, there's plenty of, of help around you um, and, uh, uh, and you can lean on that expertise. Excellent. All right, well, I think we're pretty well at the end of our time. Um, I wanna thank you all, Ed, Jason, and Alex for joining us today. Um, the discussion really is an excellent example of why we enjoy what we do at Brightcore. As a core platform provider, we're deeply involved in supporting all of this great innovation. And we have the privilege of partnering with advisory organizations, insurance companies, SIs, and technology service providers to build new capabilities 
and do new things that help all of us serve our customers better. And, you know, thank you very much, Truman, and thank you, AIS. We really appreciate this opportunity. Truman, I'll throw it back to you. Thank you, Phil, and thanks to all the panelists today for, for sharing your modernization experiences with our community. Hopefully everybody uh, attending today found this valuable for their own journeys. Uh, and really the key message is that it's all these benefits that you're hearing about today are not out of reach of really any of our, uh, our corporate members. So really, again, thanks to Phil, thanks to Brightcore for putting this webinar together. Thanks for your support of AIS and for helping members succeed like we heard of today. Uh, so everybody attending, please make sure to visit AISonline.com to download this and review this uh, webinar as well as some others and visit Brightcore to learn more, Brightcore.com to learn more about the opportunities uh, we heard about today. Thanks for participating and adding to the AIS community. Have a great day.